It was. Okay, now I'm back. Is anybody listening? Yeah. I mean up there, hello? Um, I want to make a statement about this week. It's been wild and crazy, hasn't it? So, our president has now contracted the COVID-19 virus and is in the hospital and all kinds of rumors about just what his condition is. So we're all waiting to see how this turns out. And several people in the Senate, people who were his closest aides, other people who were in the crowd at the Rose Garden have all tested positive for this virus. And the statement I want to make is not about politics per se. I'm not advocating who you should be voting for in November, but what I'm saying is this is a result of arrogance and skepticism. We need to be praying for our leaders. We need to be praying for our nation. And we need to make sure that we practice wearing masks and safe distancing. We're heading into winter. And the predictions for our state of the health this winter are not good. And unfortunately, our administration, our president, has set a bad example for us. But maybe this will wake people up. I sure hope and pray so. So before we actually begin the service, I'd like to invite you to pray for our nation. O oh God, Father of our nation, Father of our fathers, we come to you this morning a humble and contrite people. For our leader, our president, has been laid low by this COVID-19 virus. And other people are sick, ill, around him. And so we pause to pray for our president, for his full and complete recovery. And we pray for his wife, Melania, and for his aides and the senators and other people who were in attendance at the Rose Garden ceremony that either they may not get the disease, or if they do, we would pray that it would be light. We pray in a time when our nation is sown by discord and confusion, that you would shine your everlasting light on us. God of our fathers, God of our nation, redeem us and guide us through this dark night and help us to remember that you you alone rule in our hearts and that we follow you Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior in his name in your name we pray these things Amen one other thing when you're following the news, make sure you're following the news. I remember my sister and I, when we were young, we didn't have television in our rural home. We, one of the shows we liked to watch, listen to on radio was Dragnet, and I always remember Jack Friday saying, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. So there are lots of rumors out there, and they make no sense whatsoever. Find out what the facts are as much as you can. God bless us all. God bless America.
Hello. Wake up and say hi to everybody. Our call to worship today. Today we gather around God's table from near and far. Though we differ in language, custom, and tradition, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. For there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We are one in God's spirit. We are one, and together we remember the, our Lord Jesus we are the people of redemption. Come, let us worship the God of our salvation. You know, as bad as things are, and they could be worse, in fact, we think about other nations, other places in the world where this COVID virus is running rampant. We think of the discord that is going on within and between nations. In spite of our problems here in the United States of America, we are blessed. All the world does not share those blessings. Jesus Christ came from God for all of us. Even for those who do not recognize him as Messiah. There are Christians in worship today all over the world. Some are rich, wealthy, worshiping in mighty cathedrals. Others are very humble and poor, worshiping in shacks or maybe just out in the fields. But we're all worshiping together and we're all celebrating communion together because this is World Communion Sunday, in which we are reminded that we are all the children of God. And so we worship together as followers of Jesus Christ. We don't always do so well. We get focused on our own issues, our own problems, our own country, our own state. But I'd like you to think about the whole world for a moment. Because we have a responsibility as Christians, not just here at home, but everywhere. And we haven't always done so well with that. So I'd like to invite you to join with me now in prayer of confession. Almighty God, Mother of mercy, Father of grace, you have called us to one table, but we have pursued our own course. You have promised us the abundance of all creation, but in our greed, the world goes without. You have promised us the bread of life itself, but in our arrogance, the world goes hungry. You have promised us the waters of peace and justice, but in our discord, the world goes thirsty. And now we are famished too, Lord. Have mercy on us. Forgive us again. Transform us at this table and send us from this table as servants of your righteousness by the power of your Son, our Lord. Amen. You know, sometimes I wonder why God just doesn't roll up the whole the carpet and the stars and the galaxies and just toss it away. But God loves us, and God is merciful. God is just. God forgives us when we truly repent and when we resolve to walk in another way, to walk in the ways of peace and justice with love. And so the good news that I announce to you as through, that is through your faith, your acceptance of the forgiveness of God shown us in Jesus Christ, that we are forgiven and we are asked and given a chance to do better. Please join me in the written response. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. 
Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. The Hebrew scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Let me sing for my loved one a love song for his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it, cleared away its stones, planted it with excellent vines, built a tower inside it, and dug out a wine vat in it. He expected it to grow good grapes, but it grew rotten grapes. So now, you who live in Jerusalem, you people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I haven't done for it? When I expected it to grow good grapes, why did it grow rotten grapes? Now let me tell you what I'm doing to my vineyard. I'm removing its hedge so it will be destroyed. I'm breaking down its walls so it will be trampled. I'll turn it into a ruin. It won't be pruned or hoed and thorns and thistles will grow up. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord of heavenly forces is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are the plantings in which God delighted. God expected justice, but there was bloodshed, righteousness, but there was a cry of distress. The epistle reading is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. So I have good reason to have this kind of confidence. If anyone else has reason to put their confidence in physical advantages, I have even more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. With respect to observing the law, I am a Pharisee. With respect to devotion to the faith, I harass the church. With respect to righteousness under the law, I'm blameless. These things were my assets but I wrote them off as a loss for the sake of Christ. But even beyond that, I consider everything a loss in comparison with the superior value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have lost everything for him, but what I lost I think of as sewer trash, so that I might gain Christ and be found in him. In Christ I have a righteousness that is not my own, and that does not come from the law, but rather from the faithfulness of Christ. It is the righteousness of God that is based on faith. The righteousness that I have comes from knowing Christ, the power of his resurrection, and the participation in his sufferings. It includes being conformed to his death so that I may perhaps reach the goal of the resurrection of the dead. It's not that I have already reached this goal or have already been perfected, but I pursue it so that I may grab hold of it because Christ grabbed hold of me for just this purpose. Brothers and sisters, I myself don't think I've reached it. But I do this one thing. I forget about the things behind me and reach out for the things ahead of me. The goal I pursue is the prize of God's upward call in Christ Jesus. I'm going to say something. In, uh, in the world of European culture, we've lost the art of drumming and dancing as ritual worship. And now I think we're really missing something because many cultures understand that by drumming and by dancing, we put ourselves into a different space. We put ourselves in a space where we can actively offer our highest being to God, offer our prayers to God. So this morning, under the leadership of our music director, Dr. Karen Stafford, we're going to bring that ritual back. Oh, I'm sorry. You can say it again. All right. Um... I'm standing back and leaving my mask on because it's not good to share mics, but can everybody hear me okay? All right. I'll leave my... Now can you hear me? Okay. Um, the heartbeat and the rhythm of drumming always taps into the inner soul. It's one of my favorite things in the world to do. It was one of my 
it was probably the favorite activity that I ever had with my students. And I always told my students that a drum circle is a conversation. You have to listen across and mix your uniqueness with everybody else's to create beautiful rhythmic harmony. If you yell or if you dominate, or even if you're too afraid to, be, to participate, it falls apart. And with that understanding, usually the kids did great. And it takes no knowledge of reading music at all. It's what's in you. And as Pastor Gill had talked about earlier, there's, there's too much bad drumming in the world if you get my drift. So I want this drumming to be symbolic of how we can put together our differences and create a beautiful blend. Just like Romans 12, 4 through 5 said, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of, one of another. So that's how a drum circle is put together. You're going to notice that you have instruments in the pews, and then there's drums up here. I totally promise you, I was here yesterday, I thoroughly cleaned all the instruments. If there are instruments in the pews, you're going to notice that there are gloves there. A couple of them have paper towels because I ran out of gloves. But I don't want fear of infection to keep you because I cleaned them. And the drums up here have, actually have Clorox wipes. I had some at home. And hand sanitizer, so there's not to be a fear of the infection. I've been very careful, unless you're with the family, don't share them. Even the chimes. And the chimes up here are the best of all because they're free. You run your finger along them and they're free. And if you choose to play the chimes, you just grab it here or you can just play on the stand. And as I start playing, I want you to be free to listen. Don't copy me, because that's the other thing I told kids. You don't copy everybody. Because if you say, what did you have for lunch? And somebody else says, what did you have for lunch? That's not a very good conversation. Fill in the gaps. Just get a feel for what your heart is saying and let your rhythm inside fill your soul. If you don't have an instrument and you want to pack, or clap, or snap, that's whole body percussion. I will adjust, if we change our conversation, I'll adjust, and you adjust with me.
Amen. Oh, well, this is recording. This is I don't believe it. All stuck out there, sitting down. We're going to do this again. There's a drum there. There's a drum here. There are chimes there. Get out of your pews and get up here, some of you. And if the children come up, pound on the drums. Hey, some of you stick in the buds back there, the back row. Get up here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. You know, I'd hate our new candidate to come and think we're a bunch of stuck in the mud old fuddy duddies. Now, where did I put myself? Oh, I'm over here. Don't bother to follow me around with the camera. I don't know where I'm going. That's actually fun, you know? Fun. You know what fun means? When I was in seminary, we had an Old Testament, I mean, a New Testament professor, good German Wilhelm something. And in chapel sometimes when he was celebrating communion with us, he would say, this is a joyful feast. Don't take it so seriously. So I'm going to tell you a parable. I'm going to tell you a story this morning. It's not my story. It's a story told by Jesus. It comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. And so Jesus said to his disciples, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Then he rented it to tenant farmers and took a trip. When it was time for harvest, he sent his servants to the tenant farmers to collect his fruit. But the tenant farmers grabbed the servants. They beat some of them, and some of them they killed. Some of them they stoned to death. 
again. He sent other servants, more than the first group. They treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come on, let's kill him and we'll have his inheritance. <clears throat> they grabbed him, threw him out in the vineyard, and killed him. When the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenant farmers? What do you think he'll do? Yeah. He said he will totally destroy those wicked farmers and rent the vineyard to other tenant farmers who will give him his share of the fruit when it's ready. Does that sound fair? Does that sound fair? No? Well, we have a difference of opinion here. So Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? The Lord has done this, and it's amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that God's kingdom will be taken away from you and will be given to a people who will produce its fruit. Whoever falls on this stone will be crushed, and the stone will crush the person who falls on it. Now when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard the parable, they knew Jesus was talking about them. They were trying to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because he was a prophet. The word of God for the people of God. Back in the uh, early 70s, uh, mid 70s, yeah, I returned back to my hometown, lived there two or three years. And on the farm, we had a small vineyard. Well, those were all table grapes. But that didn't stop me from trying. So, I picked the grapes. I put them in large plastic barrels. I washed my feet, and then I stomped them. Turned them into mush. You know what I did with the mush? I pressed it. Squeezed all the juice out. And then I poured it into a big vat. And I strained it, and I poured it into a big bottle and put a little bubble top on it so the carbon dioxide could come up and bubble out. And you know what happened inside? You know what happened inside? Do you know what happened inside? No? It was a miracle. Because the wine and the sugar in the wine with the yeast, turned it into wine. Just like the wine for communion. Just like the yeast in the bread. It changed it. It transformed it. Well, you know, I didn't think that Chino Valley, Arizona was ever going to make it as a wine uh, country, but some years later, some friends of mine, Kit and Robin, they plowed their alfalfa field under and planted vineyards and now they've got one of the best wineries in Arizona. And I have to say their wine's even better than Missouri wines. Oop, I better stop. So I kind of like small grower owner wineries. Enough of this big corporate business. So today the subject is vineyards and their owners. And we ask, who owns any given vineyard? And what about the world as a vineyard? Who owns the world? Well, this morning we're looking at two texts. One of them is from Isaiah, and the other is from Jesus. 
We'll start with Isaiah. He talks about a vineyard that was owned by a loved one, a beloved, he calls it, him. And he wrote a poem. He said, let me sing a song for my loved one, a love song for his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it, he cleared away its stones, planted it with excellent vines, built a tower inside it, and dug out a wine vat in it. But alas, the grapes were rotten. They're terrible. Couldn't make wine out of them. So do you know what he did? What do you think he did? He tore out the vineyard. He let the weeds and the brambles take it over. He abandoned the field. Now who was the beloved owner of this vineyard? Anyone want to make a guess? God. It was God. Well, Isaiah said, the vineyard of the Lord of heavenly hosts is the house of Israel. And the people of Judah are the plantings in which God was delighted. God expected justice, but there was bloodshed. Righteousness but there was a cry of distress. So, that was a warning to the people of Judah. If we are the vineyard, will God tear us out of our ground of being? In the parable, God once again is portrayed as the owner of the vineyard. Now, this owner leashed out the vineyard just as God has lent us this beloved, beautiful planet. And when the time came to collect his share of the grapes, they killed, the tenants killed his servants, and again, and even his son. Now, when they beat and killed his beloved son, God was furious. Who was that beloved son? <coughs> what? Jesus. It was Jesus. And so Jesus asked, what will God do to these wicked tenants? He will totally destroy those wicked farmers and rent the vineyard to other tenant farmers who will give him the fruit when it's ready. Now I need a little context here. The time Matthew was writing his gospel, the world was in turmoil. The Jews had already unsuccessfully revolted against the Romans. The Jews were blaming it on the Christians, who they saw as a dangerous sect. And so the Jewish religious leadership was rejecting the Christians, was rejecting the claims of Jesus as Messiah or Son of God. And so what Matthew is putting in, whether Jesus said it this way exactly or not, I don't know, but what Matthew is putting into Jesus' mouth was this morning. All right, God sent you your Messiah. You rejected him. Now the Gentiles get him. God gives his gifts to those who accept them, not reject them. Well, think about this. The world is God's vineyard. God created it and all of its creatures, including us. <coughs> the Genesis story sent Adam and Eve on the earth in the Garden of Eden as caretakers, humans as caretakers of the planet. But our progenitors turned away from God. And we've been doing it ever since as a whole people. God gave Adam and Eve sons, and one killed the other. One was a farmer, the other a herder. <coughs> this represents a conflict between the old nomadic ways that were giving ways to the new farms and cities being built in the Neolithic Revolution. 
Now here we are, driving flora and fauna to the brink of extinction. So today, <coughs> World Communion Sunday reminds us all that we all are God's children. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all the sons and daughters of the Most High. God, seen as Gaia, is Mother Earth. And Mom is getting pretty pissed off. Rampaging fires and roaring hurricanes. Pestilences like locusts in Africa. And plagues like the coronavirus. We have to remind ourselves today that all the people of the world are God's people. So if God favors anyone, it would be the dispossessed, the poor, the marginalized. We who are wealthy, we already have enough. But what about those who don't? So as Christians today, we come together at this feast to celebrate the unity of all creation, reminding ourselves that God is the creator of all people, of all religions, races, and cultures. Jesus embraces us all in the sacrament of Holy Communion, and we are to embrace each other, even strangers, as members of God's vineyard. And I wonder, how can we take care of God's vineyard when we can't even take care of each other? Amen. So on this Sunday, as every Sunday, we receive the morning offering. We're going to uh, do things a little differently this morning. We're going to return to having one usher with a mask, bring your offerings forward. And we're going to do, I'm doing an old, old ritual, an old custom in the church. Christian church is still practiced with the Catholics and Episcopalians and Lutherans because the bread and the wine are usually brought forth by the people. They produce it. And so you'll see some real bread coming forward. And so let us praise God, give thanks, and hum the doxology. Bless these gifts, O Lord, that represent our time, our labor, our efforts, and this bread made by human hands. Bless it and bless us and use us as your servants to heal a broken world in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, as you can tell, I spent hours getting this bread by going by schnooks, whoops, by making it into dough. And it's a little like giving birth, isn't it? Well, I'll just bite it off. There we go. So, um, before we do this, I'm going to ask Connie to come forward. 
because you've all, you're there, aren't you, Connie? Oh, she's got to come downstairs. You knew you were going to do this. So remember how it is on the airlines when you're getting into your seats and getting comfortable, then they come on the PA and they announce all the safety features and tell you how to do what you already know how to do a thousand times before and somebody's up there up front. So what Connie and I are going to do is we're going to show you how to use these uh, new communion, little communion kits that you've each been given. So Connie is going to be the, I'm going to just stay there. Yeah, and now what, what you're going to do is, first of all, make sure your seat belts are fastened firmly and securely. Where's your seat belt? Right here. Oh. So what you do is you, first of all, lift off the very top. And it's clear. It's clear. And what do you find under it? The bread. The little bread, a little wafer. Now, you don't need to do that just yet. Because then you might spill it. So don't do anything. Just watch. And then what do you do next, Connie? And the second layer is to go back. You don't have to do it all the way either. It's a great juice. And guess what's in there? The wine. Well, grape juice. Here's the wine, and guess who gets it? Am I dismissed? Thank you. So let us enter into the service of communion. Don't drink anything, don't eat anything yet. Wait until the flight attendants have told you it's okay. Christ invites us all to this holy feast. As we gather this morning, we remember our sisters and brothers from above and below the equator, from the north and from down under from every time zone around the globe. As today's sunlight inches across land and sea, Christians gather to celebrate their place in God's family. All are invited and all are welcome. Come, for the meal is now ready. I think there's supposed to be a song. God be the glory, great things God has done, to prepare ourselves to partake of this holy meal, let us pray. Healing God, we come before you broken, yet seeking wholeness, isolated, yet seeking community, overwhelmed, yet seeking simplicity, 
shamed yet seeking grace. God, we yearn for the healing you promise. God of justice, we come before you selfish, yet seeking a generous heart, arrogant, yet seeking humility, responsible for injustices, yet seeking forgiveness. God, we yearn for the justice you promised. God of peace, we come before you afraid, yet seeking assurance, agitated, yet seeking serenity, angry, yet seeking a forgiving heart. God, we yearn for the peace you promise. Knowing that through Christ all things are made new, we come to this communion table to be recreated through the bread and cup and to be renewed in our faith and commitment. God, we submit ourselves to renewal through you. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let us pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God, may this bread connect us more closely with you and with our neighbors near and far. May this fruit of the vine remind us of the interconnectedness of people around the world. Bless this cup, we pray. May this simple meal bring us into union with you, your people, and your world united in the one body of Christ. And so, the bread of life shared with you. You may now take your little sample airline-sized wafer. and the cup of the new covenant shared with you. Bless you. You gotta watch that high alcohol content in that grape juice. And let us pray together. Loving and gracious God, thank you for this holy meal. Thank you for Jesus and his all-inclusive love for humanity. Thank you for this day which we worship and serve you. Amen. Couple of announcements. First of all, Mandy up there gave me an announcement wanting to urge you to remember. Now children, listen, kids, kids, there will be Sunday school next week. It will be outside. Yeah, well, it's safer. You have to wear masks. If you want to come, wear a mask. But there will be Sunday school. Put on a happy face. Also, I've uh, notified that Evelyn Baker is showing slight improvement. She's still at Sullivan Hospital, but may be moved to the next couple of days, and we want to keep her in our prayers. Now, thou shalt not. Got your attention? Thou shalt not, for the next few weeks, park in our parking lots. Because they're going to be resealed and striped. And we don't want to have any of your tire prints in the asphalt, and we don't want to see smeared parking stripes. So you can park on the street, you can park across the way at City Hall, but not in the parking lots. 
And if you do, you may your car sink to the axles in the muck. <laughs> and next Sunday, we have our annual crop walk that will begin at um, 1 p.m. after church on Sunday. And if you prefer, you can walk at home, but who's going to keep track of you? A sign-up sheet is posted on the bulletin board downstairs in the lower commons. And do you have some rockers? Yes, there's nine so far. So we have nine rockers, too. So if you like to get your exercise doing nothing, that's kind of my way of doing it. No, that's going to be over at, um, where is that going to be? Where are they going to be rocking? Huh? Oh, you already rocked. $565. Oh, well, great. Did you rock around the clock? Did you rock around the clock? I did. Yeah, you did. Now, Edith Ann, tell the truth. Two hours and Norma did five. Wow. Wow. Okay. And I want to remind you that on the weekend of the 17th and 18th, we have our new candidate coming to meet us and speak with us. So um, keep those calendar dates open. On Saturday the 17th, our candidate will be meeting us in an open reception, safe reception, and he'll be preaching and leading worship on October 18th. And I hope we will be voting to call him and he will accept. So keep that weekend open and pray. Any other announcements? Music. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. Hold hands with God and with everybody safely, except don't touch one another. Bless you. <laughs>